Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Hey, Alec Webb, thank you very much for the introduction. This is MotorWeek podcast number 153, and around our table in Studio C at MotorWeek World Headquarters, writer producer Brian Robinson. Hello, John. Road test producer Ben Davis. Hey there. Assistant producer Greg Carlos. All right. Online content coordinator Patrick Lucas. Yes, sir. And by telephone from the sunny state of Florida is our FYI reporter Lauren Morrison. Hey, hey. And she is there. Success. I'm here. Uh, and phones if, work. And the phones work. And with any luck, you'll on our video cast, you'll actually maybe see Lauren today. Video cast. That okay. Was a, that was a great game show host voice you had there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Come on down. And we have our lightning round, a viewer question. We'll coming. see if Lauren's got a rant and rave. Uh, but first, some of the vehicles we've been testing uh, recently. And Lauren's got something special she, we'll get to in a minute. First of all, 2017 Toyota Prius Prime. For those of you that can't keep up with what's going on with the Prius, this is their new uh, PHEV plug-in hybrid. It's uh, gone from, I think, around 14 miles of range now up to, uh, what, 21, 22, 25? 25. 25, uh, to make it a little bit more viable going to and from some daily commutes. Uh, comments, uh, worth, uh, the, how, Brian, how much oh, hey. extra money you remember? Uh, I do not. I oh, would say five my. grand maybe. It's, it's about that. Sounds about right. Um, yeah. well, I got the price. I think it starts at tw- around 28 and then it'll go all the way up to 34. And that's probably, I think it's that's a four grand less, hit. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah say three, so, four. Not too bad. So but, for 10 extra miles of ba- or 15 extra miles, no, of, uh, no, no, actually, compared to the regular Prius, right. for about almost 22 or 23 extra miles of all-electric drive. Is that worth it? I think so. Um, most people commute less than 30 miles a day, and if you can do that five days a week, and I'm sure there's some you know, running around that you do, uh, going to the grocery store, running the kids to shock, soccer practice, whatnot, um, you'll probably fill up very few times a month and uh, be perfectly happy. So in that case, you'll be saving a lot of money. Um, but, and you still get – I think it looks better than the standard Prius, honestly. Too. So well, it looks more are a blacked good thing out in the front, that uh, tailgate with a full width light. Okay. So a tailgate, lot, which actually yeah. has carbon fiber in it, believe it or not. Of course. A lot yeah. less money than a Volt, a lot less range than a Volt. Is it, though, does that make it a good compromise? I mean, I'm obviously not sure it's get, a lot less than a Volt. Well, if you the, get volt the, upper is, trim, the Volt is up to is uh, uh, over 50, so. Uh, price-wise? No, no, oh, a range. I'm talking yeah. about range. No, I don't think it's that much cheaper. That, that was my issue, the Prius Prime. I don't think it's that much cheaper at all. Well, I let's see. Uh, you almost can, the same price. This is We're saying this is 28, so you can get, I guess that's right. I guess you can get uh, a Volt for what? Low 30s? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't hmm. know. I might rather have the extra mile mileage of the Volt. Um, you've driven both of them more than any of us, Greg. What do you, what do you think? I think the, um, the, the, the Volt is a better car to drive and sit in. The Prius, and this is no, uh, no other Prius is really an exception. The Prius to me has never felt very inviting. It's just not a car that I want to sit in for a while. A Volt feels a little bit more comforting. The seats are better. Um, just feel like more of a traditional car and subconsciously I feel better in it. Um, but uh, uh, compared to previous uh, Prius is the, yeah. <laughs> this yeah, one uh, drives a whole lot better. I mean, they've, it's on the new, they call it the Toyota's next generation global architecture, uh, which will keep rolling out. And it's very, it's a very nice ride. So if somebody went with a Prius, if they were comfortable with Toyota's, uh, I can't fault them for going with a Prius Prime over a Volt. But I still think that if I had the choice uh, and I could find a similar price, I'd probably go Volt. And it's got the, like, a tablet-style center yeah, stack, which you, you can't get in the regular Prius? Correct. If you go up to, uh, yeah, first off, you have to be in a Prime, and then you have to be in a uh, the top-tiered Prime, I believe. Uh, but, yeah, you get a, uh, what is it, 11.6-inch, uh, like, vertical screen, which is a lot like the Tesla screen doesn't work quite as well as a Tesla screen and doesn't look as nice. It's not it's more like a Toyota navigation screen, just bigger as opposed to like a computer tablet screen. Uh so cool, uh just doesn't work as well as I want it to. 
<laughs> well, you're right. The um, the uh, the base uh, LT uh, Volt is uh, thirty four ninety five, and I think that's after incentives. So wait, so the the base Volt is thirty four. Thirty four yeah. ninety five. So then you're at the top. You get the top of the line. Mm-hmm. Prius Prime. Does this yeah. Prius this Prius Prime also gets an incentive, right? Because it, it can drive on. Electric only it, it, it it's gets, got the, one, yeah. the MPGE rating, which is 133. Right. I don't think it, but it, anyway. does, it doesn't get as much of a, yeah. an True. incentive okay. as the Volt. But it basically it does get some. So, yeah, you've probably got realistically uh, a six grand. Does it have the Volt MPGE rating? Because I know, I think the Prius Toyota claims it's the best in the industry for an MPGE, which is 133. Yeah, that may be true. Yes, that's what we said in our test, mm-hmm. but you and, know, I'm not sure that really matters. Yeah, regardless of all that, it's in the conversation now. The previous right. Prius plug-in was not was an afterthought and not really yeah a true plug-in. So, okay, let's move on to our 2017 Mercedes Class C300 that we recently did. We basically also recently did the E300 that had the self-driving feature. This is no longer an entry-level uh, class of car for Mercedes. So having said that, do we think the new C-Class makes sense in that, you know, that vaulted middle area that, uh, or, or there with, you know, 3 Series and everything else, the Julia and A4? What do you think? Oh, well, we're talking about the coupe. We're talking about the coupe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly yeah. the coupe. We had yeah. already tested the four-door. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there will always be European sports coupes, and I love that fact. Uh, they got one of the best turbo four, uh, two liters, I think, in the game, and uh, incredibly luxurious for the money. I mean, it was nicer to me inside than you know, like some S classes from a generation or two ago. I mean, it was it was beautiful in there. Yeah. You know, it's a small market for these sport coupes, but it mm-hmm. does. Say, I think you even wrote in the uh, the road test, Brian. The Germans seem to have perfected this class of car, even though it's not as popular as it used to be. What, when you wrote that, what stood out in your mind? You think that that made you say that? I mean, it's fact that it's a very good car. I'm sure but it was beyond someone else's that, comment. I don't no, come no, up with no, this no, stuff no, on my own. It was yours. You wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> don't back away from it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, when you think of sport coupes, you think of uh, European fun to drive. Uh, style? I mean, it's supposed to make a statement. Somewhat. I'm not sure style so much. I think, like, um, maybe the Asian and even the American sport coupes might, you know, have more more in the style department. I think it's just the overall fun-to-drive, luxurious package. I think they do better than uh, anyone else. Hmm. It's Agreed. just solid, too. I yeah. remember that just being, like, a super solid car ever, like, from the way the doors shut to the way the steering felt and the way all the knobs and buttons and everything felt. I think it's just – it's extremely solid, and it separates itself nicely because it is no longer that baby Benz anymore. Um, now, if you go from a CLA to a C-Class, there's a definite jump in luxury there that I think C-Class owners will enjoy and uh, be able to say that they can separate themselves from people who just go for that entry level. See, yeah, I don't think there's anything anything about that this car that was uh, entry level, frankly. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move on now to our third hit for this first part of our show, and really, we're turning to Lauren, who is. Um, just on a feature on something that is a rising trend. Uh, we talk about Trendy. leasing new cars all the time and leasing expensive cars and leasing electric cars and all that. But there's been a recent rise in the leasing of used vehicles. What? And so, Lauren, what, what's behind that? What did you discover is the genesis for why this is even happening? Well, I mean, leasing as a whole has really taken off. Um, I think... Uh, the experts told me one out of every three new cars on the road today are are leased. So we see a lot of leased cars on the road. And then these cars are now coming off lease. So these two, three-year leases, they're coming back on the lots. And uh, dealerships, manufacturers are left to dealt with, well, what do we do with all of these off leases now? Do we sell them and you know flood the market with all these used cars? Or a lot of times they're looking into this used leasing and releasing essentially um, these cars. It is still mainly in the luxury segment, um, but the experts I, I talked to said that they are starting to see uh, a steady growth, especially with these off leases coming back onto the lot. Um, and I mean, it's still a small, it's a small part of the segment, but um, 
as more and more leases come off off lease, um, I mean, we're only going to see this, I think, trend rise. Yeah, I mean, we've got to, you know, it's interesting what you're talking about because take a, you know, three-year-old Mercedes or, or whatever, BMW, and let's say the vehicle had a fifty sixty five thousand dollars $65,000 price to start with. Here yeah. it is sitting on the lot, probably still with a $40-some-thousand price tag on it. Uh, do your the people you talk to think that the ver- the sheer fact these used cars have such a high price residual value is why this is taking off? Uh, is that playing a big factor or or not? Uh, I think a lot of them did talk about that being a factor. Is that a lot of people will come onto lots looking into buying like a lower end car as their first car? Maybe they're just graduating from college, something like that, and they've got a lot of student debt. They've got a lot of stuff to pay off. So they're looking at buying a lower-end car. They get on these lots, and they see that they can lease one of these luxury cars for the same monthly payment. And for them, it it just makes sense. A lot of times, if you're looking to get into a luxury vehicle, that's what a lot of the consumers are are kind of weighing their options now. I know when you go into uh, producing and reporting on a segment, you probably find some surprises, things that you didn't expect. Is there anything about this subject when you got into it that uh, surprised you? Like, wow, I didn't know that. Well, I think just the segment as a whole, I really didn't even know that used leasing was a thing. And, and talking with these experts, I was thinking it was a new thing. Like, we were there, you know, this was just happening. But they say this has been around since leasing has been around. But a lot of lenders haven't really got on board. A lot of manufacturers really haven't got on board with it until recently. So I think that's why we're hearing a lot more about it now is because more and more people are getting on the bandwagon more and more lenders are are willing to do this. So for me, just the whole segment, uh, when we first approached this topic, I was like, I didn't even know this was a thing. Um, So I think just the topic as a whole. For your age group, do you think this is something you would be interested in doing? I mean, let's face it, you're probably one of the youngest uh, members on the staff. (laughs) So would you basically be looking at it if you had a chance to get another car? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I... I, to me, leasing, it doesn't, I like to own my car. I want at the end, you know, I'm making a monthly payment. I want to eventually own the car. But I could see like a lot of my friends, a lot of people who maybe, like I said, want to get into a luxury car. For me, that has never been a selling point. You know, I don't need to be around town in the newest, the latest, the greatest. Um, But I I mean, like we've been saying with uh, like all the new technology and electric cars, something like that. I think it depends on what car I was going to get. If I... If I really was wanting to get an electric car, I think I'd probably lease. If I wanted to get in a luxury vehicle, I'd definitely, definitely lease. But I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm still more of a, I'm just going to buy. Uh, but, you know, the experts that I said I was talking with, I, I asked them the same thing. I said, so why does this make sense? Why are people doing this? And they say it's really, I mean, you're just weighing all your options. There can be a cost savings with it. That's why a lot of people look at it. But it's it's for each individual to decide. Um, so I don't know. I think it would depend for me. It's a good answer. And let's, uh, I appreciate it. And it looks like a very good segment. And I'm sure our audiences will get a lot of useful information out of it, exposing them to something they probably didn't even know existed. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we're going to move on now to our lightning round. And this is not so much an issue as something that's just happened, and we thought we might have a little uh, fun with it. Uh, we have two minutes to discuss a trending <laughs> automotive topic. And, boy, if this week, if if the automotive websites that report going on have anything to say, this was a big headline. Jay Leno has announced that he is releasing a line of car care products. He's endorsing this. It's on jaylenosgarage.com. Uh, is this a gimmick? Uh, is there, are we surprised that somebody uh, like uh, Leno would um, basically become a product um, pitch man? <laughs> or does he enhance the whole idea? What do you think about it? Well, what's the last part can, of the question? Can I lease them? No, I'm not going to read the last part. Will that. we ever will, see will, a will John Davis line of similar products? <laughs> if I ever get as popular as Jay Leno, you just might. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody, do anybody have a, have a thought about this? Is it somehow, is it normal? I mean, his, he, this is a huge star. He means a lot to everybody that's in our business. He's extraordinarily reputable. He's got a great car collection. Does it make sense? I makes sense for him probably, but I, (laughs) I never, I never look at something that's endorsed by a celebrity and think that's, that's quality. I got to have that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have to see video of his, uh, 
detail guys like using his products on his million dollar vehicles believe it or not i might actually go the opposite way when i see somebody's face or like a jay leno because yeah. it's it's very rarely done in a night in a good way it's always done kind of cheesy like mm-hmm. oh that's seen on tv jay leno uses this on his cars so i could i don't see where it might i, I could see where some people might be caught by that but uh is it going to be a big box many. line of products or uh, is it going to be like a walmart i think they're day? testing it and no it's an only be bought online and right now okay. it's a kit of four products including a wash a detailer um uh, a smudge spray and a wax you can only buy it as a kit and i will give him credit is that actually it's fairly inexpensive it's uh, 60 bucks for the kit where you can go online and find similar kits from companies you've never heard of that are supposedly high end for two three and four times that amount and Mm -hmm. that's his pitch and like here great products i've endorsed them but not you know over the top pricing uh so for that aspect i give him a whole lot of credit but i i also agree with what uh, greg just said that you know when you see Things like this endorse six months later, they often end up on you know QVC, yeah. QVC, <laughs> or something or like that. Or or TJ Maxx, or or something like, like, like that. Horrible right. chemicals. So, I wish him luck. Uh, I hope it doesn't take his eye off the ball of doing all the Herf- other great things he does. Hopefully, it'll uh, keep his uh, revenue stream going enough to keep those cool cars yeah. in his garage. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, Lauren, did you have anything you wanted to add? We didn't even give you a chance to chime <laughs> you in. You guys are so kind of – no, I mean, I kind of agree with Greg. I mean, I when I think of – I think of cheesy, like, old sitcom stars who, like, don't have any money, like, are looking for some kind of revenue. That's why it confused me with Jay Leno because we know he has enough money. But, I mean, on the other hand, since he has enough money, I mean, he could really believe in this product. That's why he's pitching it. I don't know. I mean – I'd give it a try one time. If it sucks, just never use it again. Actually, I think your last point is so is a very you. valid one. This he's at, you could argue that uh, since uh, he left the Tonight Show, he's been riding a new crest, and he's probably more popular with more people now than ever before. I, I would imagine um, car care products. Does anybody really use them anymore? Like, how many people wax their car these days? I mean, well, that's I, a I good point. A dying, of course, uh, it's supposed to be for classic cars, I suppose. True, that's Plus true too. Cars. But uh, yeah, I think when's people. the last time any of us waxed their own car? I have. I haven't done that since I was in like my twenties. <laughs> I just did like a month ago. Yeah, Brian Robinson does. But I was in Every week, I still don't see Brian with your cell phone. Right. Well, I don't even Elbow. have a waxer. <laughs> Elbow grease is a lot cheaper than all these products anyway. So <laughs> I've got Buy a cheap product and uh, use it properly. On a side note, I could fine. see John Davis uh, marketing a line of jackets. Not anymore. So in the old days when I used to be uh, the jacket king. Uh, uh, no. oh, you could bring it back. Retro no, review. John Davis. Retro sure. review. John like Davis sport members coach. only yeah. jackets retro. return. Or like watches or something when he comes up and says, now Next, you're, and he'll have now a you're nice talking. John Davis now you're watch talking. Where are those, <laughs> all those beautiful Rolexes? So. <laughs> all right, let's turn on to our viewer question. And this is a really good one because it has to do with something uh, we test here on the show. <laughs> Uh, Alan asks, I've seen your testing of automatic emergency braking systems on a fixed barrier, and most seem to work very well. Do these systems work the same at highway speeds? If someone were tailgating you at 60 you suddenly st- uh, and they suddenly stopped, would AEB be just as effective? The short answer is probably not. Most of the manufacturers are a little fuzzy at what the top speed that the automatic braking systems will work, however, to bring you to a complete stop. However, what they all say is it will slow you down dramatically. So if you do see someone stopping in front of you and it does start to stop, that gives you more reaction time to get on and finish the job. At least that's the latest info. Yeah, it makes the impact a lot less severe. It's a 20-mile-an-hour impact instead of a 60-mile-an-hour impact. Yeah, I do think we'll see the day down the line when these automatic emergency braking systems will bring you to a full stop at highway speeds. But they are, I'm sure there must be some legal ease as why the manufacturers well, have not talked about it. A lot of them now, too, sort of all these systems are so robust and they work like in conjunction with each other. So And they're necessary for autonomous driving. Right, and so a lot of them have adaptive crews, which is, I think, a lot more prevalent right. these days than uh, – Automatic, automatic emergency. Breaking. So between that and between adaptive cruise and automatic emergency, you might be able to 
fully stop the car because I don't see how you can ignore it. You'd have to be you'd have to be that, comatose yeah. mm-hmm. because as soon as the car starts to see something in front of it, and it starts to slow down. Your first reaction is, "Why am I going so slow?" And then if you really ignore all that, yeah. And I think his question more was um, the person who's tailgating you. If they have automatic emergency braking, because obviously right. you're the one being tailgated, right. your your car is not going to automatically stop. But I mean, oh, that's a, okay. He's I interpreted look it out. as he was looking at a car in front of him. No, no, no. Uh, he's, you're, he's, you're, saying he's you're saying he's talking about a car he's coming being up behind tailgated. you. He suddenly has to stop. Is the car behind him with automatic emergency braking going to fully take over, or is the guy going to plow into him? At Same answer. Yeah. It's He's going to probably hit him, but at a lower speed. Yeah, it all yeah. depends on the distance. I mean, yeah. if it's super close, no, it'll slow it down, but it's not going to stop it. Yeah. It all depends on the speed, too. It might just yeah. give the... 60 miles an hour. might just give you an right alert. Yeah, true, but... Uh, <laughs> I, a lot of times in, with crash barrier, crash barrier tests, you go too fast. It, it'll just alert you. It won't try to slow yeah, you down at all. I mean, we've mm-hmm. we've done it a lot, and some cars will work literally all the way up to 30 miles an hour, yeah. and others will maybe sure. kind of start slowing down at like 20 or 25 right. and things like that. And then some will just give you audible. Which is the reasoning for their vague kind of any definition. Kind of of intervention. Yeah. The, um, the automakers have actually been improving these systems so much from one year to the next. You can get a car that looks exactly the same and that it hasn't had a model facelift. And that system from one year to second year to third year, drastically different. Because Very it's true. just a matter of changing the software. So, Alan, if you see a car coming up from behind you and they are tailgating, <laughs> and it may be Speed a up. high-end luxury car, <laughs> Ask them if they have best thing is to Patrick. let them pass you because uh, there's no guarantee uh, that it's not going to end up in your back seat, even if it has AEB. And just don't let your interest get the best of you and just... Just bail. <laughs> Just assume it would Lauren, stop. Don't. Always look for an escape route. Don't hit the brakes. That's that's another good piece of advice. Lauren, have you ever had an experience with something like that? I don't think so. I was just trying to think about that. I don't think so. Uh, but I don't know. You, you guys kind of seem to hit it on the head. Do drivers down in Florida, uh, where you basically reside most of the time now, do you find them any worse or better than in the Mid-Atlantic? Are they more apt to tailgate? I feel feel like everybody's more chilled here than in... Chilled? Chilled. I feel like they're chilled out. Everybody's on the road. I don't... I... Everybody, the one thing that I've noticed, you know, if you're like stopped at a stoplight, but like say it's in, you know, in between like a store and people are, you know, still trying to get into like the flow of traffic, but there's a stoplight ahead. Like people will let you in more easily. I don't know. I, I feel like there's, I did a piece on road rage not too long ago. I don't feel like there's a whole lot of road rage going down, uh, down on uh, in the South, but I don't know. Maybe it could be something in the water. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. they just retired from road rage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Which brings us to our rant and rave. Anybody got something that they want to um, spout off about that particularly has been annoying lately? I'll drop something real quick, but I don't, I'm not sure if I've said it before. Stop me if I have. Uh, the use of piano black inside cars and outside cars these days, especially no, on B-pillars and stuff. No. Have I mentioned that? Uh, I don't know. We've not privately uh, about it. But, but obviously there's something that, yeah. up, that yeah. recently yeah. has gotten. <laughs> Even on uh, the brand-new cars that we get, uh, everybody seems to want to use – blacked out b pillars and they use the piano black Mm -hmm. and as soon as you wash the car once it's just a horrible amount of cobweb scratches all over it we can't even polarize it out with our lenses sometimes and this is a car that has you know a thousand miles on. i'm noticing that a lot on um the more and more cars have uh front radar and uh camera systems they put on the grill they put like this little plaque of just sort of piano blacked out Mm -hmm. kind of thing over the sensor and yeah, I mean, that stuff would get scuffed up by everything on the road. So it's not the fingerprint issue like you'd have well, on a... Well, inside it's the fingerprint. Inside, 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 inside the fingerprint, just like you'd have on a, a refrigerator. Well, sometimes it scratches on inside, too, stuff. Yeah. yeah, Yeah, it's cobweb, yeah. horrible cobweb yeah. scratching. And uh, outside it's of date, buffing it off with something, I don't know I'm not I don't sure know you how, can. It's going to date the cars do badly. That? Oh, my God, they look terrible yeah. already. They mm. look like... <laughs> 20, 30,000 well, miles on yeah, now. Yeah, because, I mean, the um, the new iPhone has the jet black, and I had gotten into a conversation with one of the uh, Apple geniuses there in the store. <laughs> and, uh, and You have we, made my day, we sir. Got, we got into the whole <laughs> argument about, like, how cool it is. I'm like, yeah, it's cool as soon as you take it out of the box, but once you do, <laughs> there's fingerprints all over it. It's disgusting. So all the people waiting for your jet black iPhone, good luck. <laughs> 
I think you probably put it black. inside a cover anyway. Should yeah. be destroyed. Just but then why have the jet black? Why wait for the jet black? <laughs> I spend more Who money. Cares? Here, let me take off my protective cover that would allow me to drop it from a ten-story building and show it to you. Man, he would have known. <laughs> okay, I rip, think we rip. ought to in this while we're behind. Wrap Audio engineer, up. Jim Bug- Bigwood. <laughs> Bigwood. Bigwood. Thank you, Jim, for always making Pretty this sound a lot better than we have any right to. <laughs> podcast creator, Bob Mixter, who's not here to defend himself, and podcast producer, Patrick Lucas, and you've all been listening to him. Hey, it's been a lot of fun being with you again. Lauren, thanks very much for joining us. See y'all later. Thanks for everybody around the table, and thanks all of you for letting MotorWeek come into your home and your cars and uh, making us basically a destination for your automotive knowledge every week. Until next time, I'm John Davis. I can't even say my own name for all of us at MotorWeek. Be careful out there. It's been a long one. You have been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch MotorWeek, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.